Hey guys, guys, and otherwise, this is Jonathan O'Roseland. And I'm Noah, also known as Polyphonic, and you're listening to Horns and Wings, the podcast where we look at Saga, aka the greatest comic ever written, one panel at a time. This week's panel is... Uh-huh. <laughs> panel 5362, uh, which is oddly uh, just a solid black panel. Uh, so join us next week, and here's our outro theme song. Uh, did someone play the theme song yet? Oh, did they? I don't know. <laughs> Fuck. I don't remember. Way to go, George Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you sit in that one for a second. You know, yeah. I always yeah, I always come up no, I always I, come up with these cute little one liners to set up like the issue and stuff at the beginning of every episode. I'm just gonna let you I'm just gonna you know what I'm, I'm tossing it over to you this time. What do you got for us, Noah? Really set up this this issue, and then we'll and then we'll lead right into that theme song. Set up which issue, John? Issue issue thirty six of of Saga. There we go. Now we can play the theme song. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we're in it. And Noah, this is the thing that I said, let's save it for the uh, podcast, even though it might be nothing. Uh, did you see the Sandman casting? I did see the Sandman casting. What do you think? I feel good about it. I, I feel really good about it. I mean, I don't know... I, I don't know if I've ever seen the actor who's playing Dream in anything, yeah, but I also either. think that's better. Like, I feel like yeah, I don't yeah. want someone I know to be playing Dream. Yeah. Gwendolyn Christie as L- Lucifer is also incredible. That's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. Uh, Haley's actually been reading through Sandman for the first time. and Oh, that's exciting. Sandman is legitimately one of my favorite comics ever, and I have read it a total of once times. I've... I never finished it. Oh, you suck. <laughs> but it is is just like such a magical, perfect experience and such like an, an endeavor because it's like thousands of pages and and it's but it's just so it's so fucking good. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm crazy about the casting. I don't know about the actual uh, we haven't had the best luck with Neil Gaiman shows. And also I was trying to express to Haley the other day. The first season of American Gods was really good. Yeah. That and then it and then no. <laughs> <laughs> and so now and I, you know i was i was i was i was cool with uh with uh what was the uh michael sheen david Tennant, angel and oh, oh good Demon. omens good omens that, that was, was great good. yeah I, that's probably my favorite so far but uh well american gods had some fucking uh, american god for for orlando jones was was the fucking peak for me but anyway uh, I was I was trying to explain to Haley how much of a fuck you the Lucifer show is, which she's watched. She watched oh all God, of like yeah. Lucifer before reading Sandman. I was like, now you can understand now that you're reading Sandman. It's like if they if they created a Avatar: The Last Airbender show and and Aang was uh, transported to modern day New York in which he helped solve crimes <laughs> and then nothing else about this sh- about uh uh avatar ever comes up again <laughs> it's just like yeah from the mind of neil gaiman it's like fuck you <laughs> yeah it's like it's neil gaiman who dared to imagine lucifer as a handsome dude that's that's <laughs> <laughs> remember when i think he left uh hell maybe was yeah. that the plot of one of those well it's a police thing now <laughs> I, I I also I I'm also uh, excited to see it's a diverse cast. Um, yeah, I, I like... oh that Cain and Abel casting is yeah. so. Did, have you watched Taskmaster yet? Because one of those guys no. is on Taskmaster. I have not watched Taskmaster. Tax, tax, tax oh, <laughs> Taskmaster! We just made a million dollars <laughs> with that idea. Taskmaster. Oh uh, wait, hold on. Here's my pitch. You ready? It's a yep. police procedural. <laughs> where a tax man must hunt down tax criminals. Uh, I love it. From the mind of Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman. <laughs> comes the tax master. Uh, no, uh, yeah, no, it looks great. Also, I'm just, I was uh, pumped about the uh, the guy from, the bad guy from Logan being uh, the Corinthian. And I remembered yeah. how, yeah. just because I remembered like, oh, 
the Corinthian's kind of the thing that makes me pumped about a live action Sandman. The Corinthian is going to, uh, it's going to be the worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and it, well, I did make a prediction to Haley. I was like, how much do you want to bet that like 99% of this show will be just modern day? And that's the thing that oh, really yeah. bummed me out. It's yeah. like we if you hey you liked all that William Shakespeare stuff, congrats. Uh you might get a flashback for a scene or some bullshit. If I don't get if I don't get an episode that's Hob Gadling, I'm a fucking flip. Oh I mean it doesn't God. need to be this season, but just uh just give me give me a, a full episode of that and uh and then just a full uh boss smiley arc season. And that's it. That's all I need. And, uh, and honestly, honestly, just give me a season where it's a 10 episode season and each one is just one of the standalone stories. Give me a season where one of them is Hob Gadling. One of them is the Midsummer mm-hmm. Night's Dream. Like, like, give oh, me a se- give yeah. us give us one of the death book spinoffs as yeah. a season, please. Yeah, I, exactly. that was another thing I said. I was like, I really want Sandman to just like straight up not show up at all or barely show up in some episodes. Yeah, just make it fucking like leftover stuff just basically just just, just make it adapt to the comic Damon is what we're saying <laughs> yeah just make you know what? actually just put the comic up on the screen just have just have a very pleasant man uh hold the comic book up to a camera and then slowly turn the pages <laughs> and i will be content uh but hey let's talk about this other comic too because i forgot that this is what we do uh no we're on issue 36 of this and the end of what volume six five five yeah six? volume six six because this is the ah, end of my second dude. omnibus shit yeah oh uh, that's that word boy we're flying we're two-thirds of the way there oh uh, i wonder what i i feel like we might have a- accidentally covered these like in real time of like when they came out <laughs> like the, we were covering these at the same speed yeah as, as their release uh which i'm okay with but yeah no this is this is a good book and this cover is the f- uh, fuck this, off it's this so is good. one of my favorite covers i love it's this cover fucking up there i'd have to it's gotten to the point where there are too many uh covers for me to remember uh to where i can confidently say off the top of my head that this is my favorite but this is very well could be my favorite without having to do the legwork the brain work of remembering other shit Th- this this arc it feels like fiona staples like really went in on the details of the painted covers and like really really used the mm-hmm. re- really used it to her advantage like so so in case you want to know what we're talking about this is a yes, very very wide shot of the will walking across cliffs with sweet boy behind him and just this giant wave crashing up against the cliffs and and like the will is maybe like an inch and a half tall on the on the cover and it's it's mostly just dominated by this kind of profound landscape it's a cover that you can hear and smell when you look at it it reminds you i love the ones that remind you of where we left off and are just ominous as fuck yeah like like i knowing how the last one ended with the literal cliffhanger i i don't want to see this it's gorgeous and i and i hate looking at it because it fills me with dread and just just the visual metaphor of the will as like a storm almost you know with like the waves crashing behind him like him being walking like a force of nature yeah but then there's also this like weird serenity to it as well which yeah i mean everything about it screams like you know this this could very well be one of those fucking issues dude this ain't gonna be this ain't gonna be no pleasure cruise uh, this is, I, I'm not looking forward to it. And yet we're going to talk about it. Should I do, should I do see number one? I think you should. Okay. We open on a sign depicting a cartoon horned child running with scissors with, uh, fuck, what are you, <laughs> like the big Ghostbusters no-no symbol over <laughs> it. Is there is a that word the for that? For it? <laughs> there is there. It's the Ghostbusters no-no symbol. Yeah, that's, that's the word. <laughs> 
and the episode title. I believe it uh, comes from the ancient Greek. <laughs> uh, so the narration says uh, every school is dangerous, and then Marco portals into the prison classroom, decked out with his crash helm and bat people shield and sword. The narration continues talking about how we convince ourselves that children are safe in schools, but deep down we know that's a fantasy, that the worst case scenario isn't improbable, it's inevitable. Quote, death is so fucking predictable. And with that, a shiv is raised to Marco's neck. We turn the page to see the shiv holder, Petricor. That's my barbarian name, by the way. Shiv shiv holder, holder? Petricor. (laughs) She's speaking perfect language, thanks to Marco's translator ring. And she sniffs Marco and realizes he's Hazel's father. Petricor is confused as to how Marco fits into Noreen's escape plan. Marco's confused as to who the fuck Noreen is. And cut to Noreen's escape plan. (laughs) Clara and Lexis watch from afar as Miss Noreen carries a box she says is full of filthy art smocks, but we know is a box full of Hazel. Unbeknownst to them, but knownst to us. Uh, (laughs) Very knownst to us. Very knownst to us. Uh, The guard asks to check the box since they've had to upgrade security after some coup at the U.S. Capitol. Uh, sorry, Fang. And Noreen panics, says she forgot her phone in the classroom and turns to leave, but the guard pulls her gun, says, drop it, please. And that's where we leave off with this first scene. Shit's going down already. Oh, and we have some blue that we have to uh, oh, oh yeah, translate because Clara's talking to Lexus. What do we think? What do you think Clara's saying to Lexus here? So Lexus says, can't Ghost Girl lend a hand here? And um, uh, I think Clara's saying, no, Is basically Isabel needs the sun to be down or something. You fucking idiot. Oh. It says, no Isabel until sunset. Hey. <laughs> All right. I'm I'm pretty good at blue. But who knows? We don't know if she needs it or if she wants it to be down. No, she needs We're not it. Sure. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, we she could she who knows. Maybe what, she's just finickety. Lies. Yeah, no, maybe Maybe, maybe when they were I, on the ice planet, she just did come out for a while because she didn't feel like it. <laughs> Talk to me in my college years and I would absolutely say I cannot come out <laughs> while the sun is up. <laughs> I don't know what phase she's in. It's hard to keep a schedule. <laughs> Especially with a baby, but yeah, no. Let's let's start with the beginning here. I love this. That's such a that's such a great. We we have lost the splash page, the opening splash page again. But we get the uh, great transition from uh, the kid running with scissors, yeah. who also looks like a young Marco. Yeah, and then cut to Marco with his his sword in the classroom. This hazel narration. This is something that's going to appear kind of throughout the throughout the issue. Uh, mm-hmm. Spoiler alert! We're gonna talk more about this issue. Um, but throughout the issue, there there's this this kind of lingering thing of Hazel just kind of like hint the, the whole the whole thread of her is talking about death, and there's always th- this kind of like lingering idea of death in the air, and it's it's very tense when you're reading it. It really, especially because you know. That saga just mercilessly kills people. Um, I think it's it's very much playing into the it's playing into the knowledge that nobody is safe and really mm-hmm. really tugging at your emotions. The fact that they're focusing on specifically school is dangerous, and the fact that going into this, the two people most at risk uh, are Hazel and uh, Squire. Yeah, and so. The fact that the the whole issue is just like, or the the you know at least this narration is just like, hey, kids aren't safe. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, shit. <laughs> really yeah. playing into the fucking awful feelings I got from that cover. Uh, but also, I want to point out because this is from April 2016, uh, and so this is what a know, time, much, what a great yeah. time. <laughs> Oh God, uh, the the good old days when we just had to worry about Bowie dying. Uh, but this was also very much the the height of uh, a lot of anxiety around uh, school shootings. So this feels, I mean, this would ob- absolutely be something that was on Brian K. Vaughn's oh, mind as it yeah. was with everyone's minds at the time. Uh, but well, ev- yeah. everyone's minds in the states. 
that's a pretty well, localized yeah, yeah. problem. <laughs> but yeah, I, I that is that's so that's so smart. Like especially with the fact that you know he's obviously not specifically citing that, but it's almost that like sort of end of end of get out effect where it's like when you see the cop car lights and you're just like oh god uh, like oh fuck my understanding of how society works yeah makes me is why i'm anxious about this and so like that he is smart enough to not have to cite things specifically for to prey on that sort of uh underlying dread of americans of uh you know just how terrifying uh, yeah schools are right now <laughs> the, what else do we got in these first pages that's that's great and also fuck them for making me feel like this i love petricor saying you're one healthy slab of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh i mean well yeah i'm so petricor with uh speaking uh fluid language yeah uh, is is a delight and i'm fucking happy about it i also think it's uh this is a neat little um a cool little bit of lettering you can see petricor is framed really nicely here so that her one horn kind of leads you into her speech bubbles yeah um that's just some some nice frame composition there that's that's one thing which you know that's why like her profile from uh you know her right side is so good with her her horn layout and it's such a nice yeah asymmetry uh, which is something that I wish I had paid more attention to to see how they use it for eyeline and framing and stuff earlier. But yeah, I get the feeling we're going to see a lot of Petricor on the left side in conversation. Yeah. Uh, because her, her horns compliment. But speaking of lettering, uh, this is something that I was, I was actually talking to Haley about because Haley, of course, is a letterer. Uh, and this is something that always, always, always sticks out to me. Uh, and I wanted to bring it bring it up here. It's such a such a nitpick, but I think that you know it's something that letterers can really learn from. Uh, and it is notice on the third page, there's the exit to civilian parking sign. Yeah, and you can very much tell that it is. You can tell it's put in by the letterer because it's literally just like a you know default font like all caps font. Yeah. And I, I was just like, why does that always stick out to me? Why does that always bother me when letters add text to like a, a page? And then I realized like, it's, it's literally just the fact that like, it looks how it should look in reality. Like if you typed that font onto that sign, that's exactly how it would look, but nothing else looks how it actually looks in reality as realistic as fiona staples uh, yeah. uh, art is if you i mean just looking at like the lines outlining that sign there is variations in the thickness of the lines uh with all of the hard angles and stuff uh that are very clearly hand drawn and uh and that's what i was talking to Haley about it and we decided that you know just the pretty much the solution whenever you're doing environmental text like that as a letterer is you do what they've done here uh where you figure out because like the perspective is perfect and everything it is just the consistency of those lines and stuff and uh we were talking about how like you know the solution might be ask the uh ask the artist what brush tip they used uh, mm -hmm. if they did digital inking and then going back over those letters and just using that that pen tip to uh, or that brush tip to go back over it just to make it feel like it's more in the environment because I don't know why that is just always whenever you see like a newspaper article or anything yeah. like that in a comic it always sticks out to me as just like just something added on top of the art instead of being a part of it uh, so yeah, that's just a little, that's a little lettering thing. Some, something else I love in this scene is just the physical mm -hmm. comedy of Noreen is hilarious. <laughs> like the yeah. look on her eye when they say the security's bumped up, by the way, the security up yep. to code gray is also hilarious in this prison yeah. where it's just like, everything is gray. <laughs> There's code purple and code gray and that's it. Yeah. I, I love these two panels on the next page where, like, it's, like, Noreen approaching the guard and then Noreen turning around and scrambling away. Yeah, Noreen continues to be a fucking treat. Oh, one thing I notice. I'm just full of nitpicks today, but just an interesting thing. I realize that the Crash Helm is a little uh, discriminatory towards uh, differently horned people. Well, Have it's, you noticed that? it's I, I don't think that it's 
all crash helms necessarily because that's like their family crash helm right no this is the one they stole from the museum oh well then yeah it's uh, oh yeah oh yeah. yeah yeah so they're they're racist yep or ableists i i'm pretty yeah. sure i'm pretty sure that the entire the entire point of uh of of saga is that both sides are racist <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but acknowledge my observation, <laughs> please. Uh, but yeah, I want. I just. I. I want that to be. I mean, fucking knowing Saga, it's like plot point in the future that uh, Vez is Someone's gonna be held. able to yeah. fucking or like that Rhino guy that uh, Prince Robot interrogated in like issue three just isn't gonna be able to use a crash helm because his horns don't fit into it. <laughs> I don't know why, but I I just really love the acting here when uh, Petricor is sniffing. It's it's good facial expressions mm -hmm. by Fiona Staples. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I think I'm I'm pretty much uh, I'm pretty much good to go on to the next scene. If you are, ah uh, yes, I am. Let's do it. We end that scene on some THN F first first THN that we've mentioned since the uh, since the break. I think. Welcome back. Oh yeah, there wasn't. Th sorry, just th I wanted to point out there wasn't any uh, narration last issue, which we yeah. totally missed. Yeah, and that's only happened like once or twice before, uh, which is interesting because Hazel was in that issue for a scene, but we just didn't need it. Yeah, I, f I feel like we would have noticed it more if we had been reading regularly. But uh, yeah, if we were good at our jobs. Yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> Wait, this is a job. <laughs> You get paid for oh, this? for you. <laughs> oh, that doesn't. That's not what makes it a job. <laughs> it's that. It's that uh, dying in your heart. That oh makes yeah, it a I job, know. Okay, then is this is definitely a job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Teachers always promise that students are in a safe place, but most of us figure out that's a lie pretty fast, and then we turn to the next page. My very first fire drill was all the confirmation I needed that the worst can happen anywhere, anytime. As Hazel says that, we get a wide shot of the Star Whacker, and then we cut inside. Doff is using the tooth of a Sky Shark to cut his ropes. Upshur tries to tell him that his effort is futile, but Doff says, I plan to go out shooting, looking at his camera, which I love. <laughs> we turn the page and we're outside. The Will and Goose are facing off. Goose is threatening the Will and he swears on the buried treasure of, of the house <laughs> of Goose, which is great. <laughs> and then Sweet Boy does his snuffed thing right into Frendo, sending Frendo unconscious and Goose goes flying. Goose stands up and puts on his war face, hissing at the will before running at him and chopping the will's fucking fingers off with the axe. Like, <laughs> five, four, four fingers, no thumb, just gets four fingers in one fucking clean fucking swoosh. Fucking right hand, too. Yeah. Jesus. The will punches Goose in the face with his other hand. And we end on some more transitional hazel narrer, narr, narrer, some transitional <laughs> hazel narrer. <laughs> we found the perfect abbreviation. Uh, we we <laughs> we end on some traditional hazel narration that says, even if they've never seen it happen, most kids understand that all lives end. Oh, which do, you can't fucking say that on a panel. Where Goose is being punched in the face. Goose has kind of done the most damage. Or, well, I love that it's literally Goose and Sophie that have done the yeah. most damage to the will. <laughs> that, that dude uh, lets his guard down. I want I want Goose and Sophie to team up. They, they'd be unstoppable. <laughs> Goose and Sophie kill the saga universe. Yeah. <laughs> I I did mention Goose, but it's really worth noting that the Hazel narration, even if they've never seen it happen, most kids understand that all lives end, is wrapped around Squire, which goes back into kind yeah. of what you were talking about with, with dead kids. Yeah, wrapped around Squire, and we're getting uh, our first 
proper violence against Goose that I'm not a huge fan of. But I am fucking will. a huge fan of our first proper violence from Goose. <laughs> that was that was fantastic. Yeah, I, I love <laughs> Goose's like good moment. hissing face he makes too, which is it's very it oh, yeah. looks very much like like oh. when an animal goes kind of feral. Also, that that fucking the uh, blood smear on his axe in that in that fr- uh, panel where he's he's chopping off the fingers. yeah yeah. So oh, I good. didn't notice that. That's such a good little detail. Uh, uh, also, uh, I appreciate. I appreciate call this a John theory, if you will. Oh, the fact John that the theory, shark John. head, the fact that the shark head makes a shk noise, which is really just an abbreviation for shark. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so it's essentially that's a thing that uh, that uh, Matt Fraction does a lot in comics. Uh, where he'll just use the the word of the thing making the noise as the noise. So, like, if glass breaks, it'll just say, glass. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. And, and, and I'd, I'd like to think it's somewhat intentional. Does, does he do that? It, well, I feel like, I feel like that's also cool in his, uh, in his Hawkeye. Yeah. Oh, that's what the glass is. Yeah. From. Yeah. 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 That's really cool. Although, if you want to see the best, the best onomatopoeia uh, ever, uh, Matt Rosenberg's uh, four kids walk into a bank, which is a bank heist thing with children. He'll use words that sound like onomatopoeia, but are related to the thing that's happening. Uh, the main one I remember is like someone getting hit in the face with like uh, a pizza, and the sound effect being sabaro. <laughs> <laughs> it just made me really happy. Go check out Four Kids Walking to a Bank. That's a that's a our, our fans would enjoy that one too. That's amazing. I just I just wanted to mention on these flying sharks here. Um, I don't know why it's taken us this long to say this, but um, mm-hmm. flying shark do 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 to do flying nope. shark do 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 do. You know, hold on. <laughs> so you didn't understand why it took us so long to ruin the podcast. <laughs> I just, I just, I feel like I, I'm, I want to sincerely apologize to my listeners. I should have picked that up earlier. Flying shark, flying shark. Not the apology you owe right now, no. Oh God. Yeah, other things in the scene. No, no, you don't get to move on. This sucks. Wait, you just want to wallow in the flying shark? Yeah, no. Give me a second. Just give you another reason to hate the flying sharks oh god <laughs> you can't fucking spit in my podcast soup like that and just be like well <laughs> on to the next bite <laughs> jesus christ all right now i'm ready i know i've said this before but i will never not love the sniffed sound effect while we're on sound oh it's perfect it's perfect and then the the action of friendo going down and throwing goose off i really love those panels they're very kind of like active panels where like yeah. you can see friendo kind of bucking up and then falling down and you see goose's cute little buttons cute little toesies flying in the air the the amount of work that Fiona's uh, grass is doing in these panels yeah. is so fucking cool because it it literally feels like action uh, like lines like movement lines yeah uh, it's always facing in the direction of where you should be looking look at uh, uh, when the will is facing down like what do we get to see on the opposite page yeah uh, that sort of establishing shot and all the grass is leading you uh, to the right side of the panel to kind of and and then when direction. and then when Frendo is unconscious and Goose has like his hands on them, it's all leading you up the hill and curving uh, up to the will again. That that has such a like yeah this this feels like yeah that like when uh, when Frendo's toppling over, it feels like the camera's moving in because of the the grass with that uh, Frendo unconscious and Goose trying to push him over uh, or check on him or whatever. Uh, it it feels kind of like that dolly zoom effect of like uh, yeah. Frodo looking down the empty road uh, in uh, Lord of the Rings. I think that a lot of this is something that comes from uh, we've talked about this a bit before, but like the anime or manga influences on uh, yeah. 
on Fiona Staples, I think she, she does a really cool way of like using a lot of the strengths of that, but mixing mm-hmm. them in with the environment to be to kind of fit in more traditionally with uh, the medium of Western comics. It's it's almost subliminal use of of manga techniques, yeah. which there's a really good one I'll bring up. Uh, I think in like the next to last scene or something but yeah no it's 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 brilliant she has a really really good handle on eye lines and where your eyes follow oh yeah that that, that's something generally for those of you who don't really like uh make art um a, a lot of a lot of good visuals and good art kind of there's a path that your eyes, it wants your eyes to naturally follow across the page. Mm-hmm. And, and that's even something that's even something I use in my videos or things like that. And it's really, really helpful to, to especially in a, in a static form like this, it gives motion by having your eyes kind of follow and process the information. It creates this sense of motion because your eyes are moving. Yeah, I, I just want, I want to see, I want to see Fiona Staples direct a film. Yeah, it would be so gorgeously shot. An- another example of the motion is like Goose's axe coming down over the hands. Like that panel is phenomenal. Oh my god, that that's another one that feels super anime with like Goose like in the air chopping downwards. Oh yeah, no, that feels that's that's I've been watching a uh, Devil Man Cry ba- Baby for the first time, and it, it, in terms of that anime style violence where the sort of viscera is hanging in the air a yeah. bit longer than it should be like is is so effective uh yeah no it's fantastic also i, I want to get your thoughts on this i'm not going to say it's a john theory i it might be a it might be a big goof who knows it might be a goof up i'll let i'll let you know i'll let you know if it's a john theory or not <laughs> but but the uh the the shot where goose is kind of checking on or pushing against uh friendo uh we get sort of a misty effect on uh the stock but not on the just as far back uh squire so do you think that it's just a matter of Fiona Staples Remember to add the sort of uh, desaturated mist effect to the stock and not Squire, or do you think it is sort of like a very subtle uh, she is illusory type thing? I think it actually is a subtle reminder that she's an illusion. Yeah. Especially because yeah. usually when you see her being an illusion, it's just the will and the stock in the frame, right? Like right. that's yeah. that's most of the time. It it'll if there's anyone else in the frame, the will is talking to himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but this time, because there's other people in the frame, I think it does kind of remind you a little bit subliminally that she's not real. Yeah, especially since like you know what it, what it, it very well could be because she is not in this scene until this point, even though we see where she's standing uh, in the establishing shot earlier. Uh, it could sort of be her like phasing in. Uh, mm, in that's way. true too. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I like that. I also just really want to commend Fiona Staples for making Goose somehow terrifyingly vicious and cutting people's fingers off, but in the same panel, making me just want to boop him on his little snoot. <laughs> I, I'm glad that we finally get the uh, Chekhov's Goose of uh, yeah <laughs> of him coming at him coming at Prince Robot. Uh, earlier in the with the axe uh in the series and and now we get to see him actually use it it's fantastic a lot of goose character building here too with the uh the Uh, the didn't even mention the buried treasure goose swears on the harried buried treasure of the house of goose oh (laughs) we need that spinoff oh my god that's what that's what a live action saga series needs to be is the house of goose yeah i'm i'm all uh, about the house of goose uh good shit i think that's all i needed to say oh oh last thing last thing uh point out is i love the uh the sort of uh lowercase punctuationless u uh, when the will has yeah. his, is reacting to his, his fingers. Like, I don't even especially know the intention of how that is being said aloud, uh, except for sort of disbelief. I think disbelief is exactly what it is, and I think it really it really conveys it. Yeah, 
and it's it's such a cool little trick and i'm sure that you know now that since they've figured out this nice little subtle trick uh, i'm sure it will not be done uh ad nauseum noah <laughs> in the rest of this very issue <laughs> should we get to the next scene yeah let's do it the narrator continues. <laughs> Even if they never see it happen, happen, most kids understand that all lives end, some sooner than others. Uh, we are back in the prison. Noreen slowly sets down the box at gunpoint. Hashtag all lives end. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> asshole. Uh, <laughs> Noreen slowly sets down the box at gunpoint. Just then, Clara shouts something in blue at Lexus and punches her in the face. Uh, the guard turns her gun towards Clara. Uh, a look of blind panic on Noreen's face, followed by her reactively kicking the guard hard in the back of the head with two of her front legs. Uh, the guard hits her head against the opposite wall, knocking her fully unconscious. Just then, Clara hears, Mom, you you have tattoos. Marco and Petricor have appeared. Uh, Hazel pops up out of the box, apologizing for being too scared to wait anymore. She locks eyes with Marco. Uh, he kneels in front of her, extending Hazel's doll, Ponkonk, who I forgot about, towards her. He says he doesn't know if she remembers the doll or remembers him, but... And then Hazel interrupts him with her eyes welling up, saying, Daddy. Uh, the narration comes back in with the story of how Marco cried the first time he got on a school bus because he thought he'd never see his family again. Despite this, Marco actually loved being a student. School taught him how much he loved being home. And Hazel tearfully hugs Marco, saying daddy over and over again. Oh, my this God. This made me cry, Noah. Yeah, yeah there's a lot a of... Bunch. There's a lot of emotions in, in this uh, in this episode, or this, this issue. Yeah, this one hit me hard. Uh, but speaking of hit hard... I fucking love the Noreen. It's so good. <laughs> Just like panicking, fucking someone up with a loud, uh, a loud pink crack, which I think like, yeah, it, it matches, uh, it matches specifically, uh, just Hazel's shirt in this. I love that they just use a totally different color that matches yeah. the overall tone of the, the scene, but on that page just to, get that shock and impact of her getting kicked by these it, it, it seems like almost like a, a horse getting kicked by like a, standing behind a horse or something it's it's such good use of noreen's character design yes yeah like yeah this feels like a thing that that uh praying mantises do yeah again this is kind of like motion and eye lines and there is some more of that kind of like uh like airlines air mm -hmm. but also the way that noreen's like torso goes back for the kick it really makes you think of the kind of like explosiveness of a praying mantis yeah yeah and also i that's this is the thing i really like is barely capturing the the action in the frame yeah almost as if like you know it's a camera that's suddenly trying to keep up with it or something yeah it it definitely the the fact that like the the guard falls off sp screen really conveys the explosive speed too yeah yeah okay no i have a story <laughs> i have a story that i literally just remembered because i was trying to think of why does why does Hazel popping out of the box remind me of something? And then I just remembered, uh, in first grade, uh, there was a Christmas play that I was in, and I always I always like went out of my way to be like the whatever goofy the goofiest flamboyant most absurd character that I could do the dumbest shit with is you? always the really role. <laughs> you fucking believe it or not, and. Uh, and so I was this this mischief making like evil elf uh, who would just like come in like uh, just fuck shit up for everyone anytime he'd show up. He was essentially. Uh, do you remember what's changed? <laughs> who's the who's the 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 guy that plays the transporter? Jason Statham. Jason Statham. I'm his character in uh, Fast and Furious Seven, where he's not actually the main bad guy or anything. He just shows and ruins. He shows up and ruins everything for everyone, and then leaves. Is that this was a me bad this, time this to elf. tell you that I've never seen 
I, I'm pretty sure the only the, the last Fast and Furious movie I saw was Tokyo Drift, or maybe the third one. I hate them all, and I am friends with uh, people who love them, and I and I hate watch them. I've hate watched probably all of them. Uh, although I will say, Hobbs and Shaw is one of the best fucking movies I've ever seen in my life. How dare you? That one gets how it. how dare you insult Tokyo Drift like that? <laughs> Anyway, anyway, anyway. Uh, so I was, I was this elf, and the the I was not in the play until halfway into this. I don't know, probably twenty minute play or something. It felt like forever. I mean, this is first grade. It felt like an hour long play, and uh, until halfway into that, I had to hide in a box that was on the stage the whole time. Uh, so I was literally just crouched in this tiny box, and I had to wait to hear my line to which someone say like here's a bowl of whatever and then i would pop out of the box and say did somebody say bowl and then grab this one person and like roll them as if i was bowling them because i'm a (laughs) fucking agent of chaos baby and uh so the thing i didn't factor uh because we didn't really do a full (laughs) run through did someone say bowl earlier oh (laughs) was how muffled it would be inside this box. Don't get ahead of me here, Noah. <laughs> and so so it felt like it felt like to the point <laughs> where where it, it was like this is taking so long. I had I had, they had to have said it by now. Like if it, it feels like it's taking hours that I'm just crouched in this like oxygen deprived <laughs> tidy space. Couldn't even poke holes in this box. And then I hear it. I hear the fucking bull line. uh, And I pop out. uh, And here's the thing. I think I hear the bull line. Yeah. (laughs) And so I pop out (laughs) in the middle of someone else's line and just shout, did somebody say bull? (laughs) And the fucking Santa Claus kid just turns to me and says, no. (laughs) What a legend. That Santa Claus kid is amazing. (laughs) And then I just like look to my teacher who's off stage. (laughs) And she just is pointing down. And so I just slowly crouch down (laughs) into my box of shame. (laughs) I feel like that makes it even funnier if you did you did you actually hit your cue later? Uh yes, yeah, I did. (laughs) It was just it was I, I feel like I saved this play for all the, the parents watching this morning. Yes, like, yeah. What, did you did you read the reviews? What did what did Rotten Tomatoes have to say about your play? <laughs> this is probably pre-internet. This is 1983. Uh, no, it was, but yeah, no. I, I just I just I somehow buried that in the into the depths of my mind, but. But Hazel <laughs> popping out when she wasn't supposed to just made it all fun back, and I'm kind of disappointed Ugh. she didn't say. Did anyone say bull? <laughs> <laughs> that would have that would have really that would have really helped the emotional tension stakes of this really beautiful reunion scene. I don't think you're understanding the the true the soul and the beauty of the eternal the soul life. and the bull <laughs> the, soul, the bull and the sooty of the internal the eternal line uh did somebody say bull <laughs> all right <laughs> because it needs to be non sequitur it needs to ruin everything that's the whole point no uh so, i have nothing else to say about this scene i think it's fucking beautiful and it's, and it made me cry i i love the look on clara's face when she sees marco too like that's such a it it's such a yeah good like fiona staples does emotion really well she's She's really talented. I don't know if we've said that enough. Yeah. She's all right. What? She's all right. She's all right? All right. She's all right. All right. Next scene. Uh, yep. Your turn. Goose is lying on the ground. Did somebody a... say bull? <laughs> I knew that was coming. Hey! <laughs> you you should have you should have waited I and done get... that later. <laughs> no, I did, but I wanted to, I wanted to give Haley a chance to to not fuck up the score over this uh, <laughs> this next summary. So I got it out of the way early. <laughs> okay, go ahead. But it could come at any second. I want you to know. <laughs> yeah. Goose is lying on the ground with a head wound. 
and Squire begs the Will not to hurt him, revealing a kid's drawing of a white flag on his screen. The Will picks up Squire and begins to choke him, saying, Long ago, I promised I was going to kill your daddy, but not until I killed everything he ever loved first. He's interrupted by a voice off screen, or off page, and turns around to see the brand, judging him for being a murderous psychopath. We quickly realize that it's another hallucination, and the brand says the stock wasn't a love, but another dumb obsession to make him feel better. The Will begins to break down and start crying. He says he misses everyone. The brand says, sure, but offing some random kid isn't going to make it hurt less. And then the Will says he doesn't know what else to do. So the brand tells him, go ask the one chick who calls you on all your bullshit. I know who that is. I think it's... I was gonna, I was gonna have a joke. Oh no, I know the, the you know this, you know the centipede boob lady <laughs> on Sextillion. That's it. So, so from there we get a wide shot of the brand walking away with Sweet Boy, as seen through the lens of Doff's newt eye camera. Upshur is panicking, but Doff is calm and happy, and he's just, he's just thrilled that they're alive, <laughs> and he and Upshur kiss. Aww. There's a lot of really sweet scenes in this, and it's the whole thing. There's just this sense of impending doom as these <laughs> sweet things are happening. Yeah, that's such a nice kiss too. It's that's a really a sweet kiss. kiss. Yeah, just the just the. I think it's specifically uh, Upshur's Upshur's eyes and just the the smizing he's doing. Yeah, in this. Yeah, I think it's, it's really nice. It's good because I was getting real fucking sick of Upshur's shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know he did he did drop another uh uh fat shame earlier in this issue he's just he's so. just really been getting on my nerves so it's nice to humanize him a little bit yeah i love everything about this scene too just there's so many emotions in this issue the the will breaking down and like the two panel reveal of kind of the back of his head and then he turns and there's tears in his eyes and he just says, I miss you. I miss everybody. Mm -hmm. Like you just, you just feel for him and you realize, I, I feel like since he's been back, he's been this like unstoppable menacing force. And, and mm -hmm. in this moment you suddenly realize, no, he's just a broken, broken man. Yeah. I kind of, I like, I kind of wish this, this scene got to be just, a whole issue yeah because it's really fucking good i i you know what i kind of want there to just here's a here's an idea for you brian okay we're on a first day basis bry 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 brad give me give me an arc where uh each issue is just one scene oh like that's all i want just a whole arc full of the because we we've gotten that essentially once with the uh prince robot and yeah Heist. yeah and that was that so was good the like fucking best. So yeah. I just want I just want like essentially six stage play scenes uh across six issues. It would just make me really happy. But yeah, this this is real hard. It's really creepy the the panel where like the brand like is talking about the stock, half her face turns into the stock's eyes, which is yeah. really creepy. They do such a good job of humanizing absolutely everyone and like just as you're like just as you think you've lost any empathy you have for the will because he's a murderous psychopath bkv just pulls you back in and you're just you're just crying for him you're just you just have all of the feels and and you just mm -hmm. i i miss the brand i get how yeah. he misses the brand because i miss the brand you want to be you want to be heartbroken by something i just realized what the panel after the brand shows up where we see the will saying Sophie and you see the brand is like sort of petting uh sweet boy but sweet boy is like looking behind oh. himself i i think i honestly think that it's the it's the will saying Sophie and it's sweet boy looking around for Sophie oh my god <laughs> which oh, is god. devastating to me <laughs> Oh, why? <laughs> but can we just appreciate like I I yeah, I love I love this. I love there's there's not as much 
this book is very reactionary. And it has that Game of Thrones feeling where it it's It is like, a reactionary text. I agree. It should be burned because it's reactionary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's like person A does this, and in response, then person B is on this plot line throughout this arc until they interact with this other person. Yeah. But this is such a rarity for this book, and is it is what makes this so fucking impactful, is that it is the will essentially i mean he's literally projecting yeah. but it's essentially him deciding for himself stopping himself before he goes too far that he does not want to go down this path and it's yeah it's it's it just has that much more of a a punch because like you know you wouldn't get half of this response if it was like and then doff came up and hit him over the head with a camera and then everyone got away like <laughs> the fact that it's the fact that he has that sort of autonomy yeah. here is is really really effective yeah yeah it's not well and and this is the thing too is i feel like i feel like when you see a voice off screen it's like like there definitely is uh al- al- already in this arc a lot of like person swoops in off screen to stop something and then it it's Mm -hmm. it's not that it's just and the panel where it cuts to the brand like no gutters the brand just leaning on a rock looking fucking cool as hell yeah god i love their shoes too oh and you know what it fucking know it fucking know it i didn't even remember this but this is vindication for my sweet boy theory last issue where i was like maybe sweet boy's seeing the brand you're like oh it can't be the brand it has to be your first like uh sexual love or whatever no it's just it's that's this true is, uh, brothers that's sister. true that's true so you know uh, mark you know and then that was the one that was the only one where i was like maybe this theory doesn't hold water but you know what i should have doubted myself because <laughs> all of them's right all of them is right still still on the still on the telepathic upshur and doff train <laughs> yeah I, i'm i'm even though even though uh the writer is not <laughs> i am <laughs> uh it's good shit hey this is a good book this is, you know what? That's why they call it the good book. The good book. <laughs> he coined that. Should we, should we get these, get these last two scenes out of here? Yes. This next one's a short one, uh, but it, it, it shifts tones so quickly here that I thought we'd break it up a bit. So, back at the prison, Marco slashes a new portal into the air with the bat sword. Uh, they send Hazel through, assuring her that her teacher is going to be okay since the guard never saw what hit her. Hazel calls back to her teacher as she hops into the portal. Thank you so much, Noreen. You read stories real good, and you were always super, and gets cut off by the teleportation. Uh, Marco apologizes to the others for only being able to take Clara through the portal now, uh, but she interrupts him with the news that she won't be leaving. Marco's shocked, saying, Mom, I'm not going to let you rot in here. Clara responds, Then let me thrive. I have a community with these people, a purpose. She adds, I'm so proud of you, baby boy. Seeing you become the man you are has been the greatest privilege of my life, and I know your father felt the same. And mm. there are lots of tears Fuck. from everyone <laughs> in the book and outside of the book. Uh, and meanwhile, in the background, Petricor says, well, if she doesn't want to take it out, as she leaps through the, por- the open portal herself. And Ugh. that's our little half a scene here. I just wanted us to, to not, not blow over that... Uh, just such a sweet it's really clo- very closurey feeling scene. yeah it's nice to get a farewell to a character that's not a death and i mean maybe yeah. clara will come back we don't know um yeah l- like everything's fair game in saga but mm-hmm. it, it if she doesn't come back i also wouldn't be surprised you know and she's mm-hmm. not dead which is just swell and she is a and she is, is a this... prisoner of war but she's not dead yeah I will point out, because, you know, obviously we are known to play coy about things we actually know about in this, <laughs> to not to not spoil things, but I will say, from what we do know, Hazel has referenced uh, Grandma, and, like, a few times in the narration, with stuff that we don't necessarily know if it was things that she was told, like, in prison, if that's what she, yeah. because she references things that Grandma said. Because she did spend, like... F- she grandma did basically raise her in prison yeah it's it, it's so so but there is there is potential for her to come back yeah but it, it's it's one of those i i like i like this this approach of like you know it's such a nice little 
send off here that it's like if she comes back hell yeah fuck yeah more clara uh if she doesn't then it's it's a totally satisfying like you can you can piece together the rest of her story from here yeah like her inciting you know riots and stuff (laughs) in in prison and and becoming the leader of the revolution i just really love i really love scenes like this where characters that love each other and want to be together realize that it's for the best if they part ways Mm -hmm. i don't know that's that's a trope that i think it's that it's that casablanca thing you can't get better than that yeah (laughs) yeah yeah it's 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 really nice and yeah just a lot of emotions in this in this issue yeah again i was i was I I, pr- I think I cried during this scene too. The the whole yeah. scene you become the man you have been is the greatest privilege of my life is so good. I am I I am in an I am in an emotionally vulnerable state right now and <laughs> and reading this and no really one's even died yet. What's happening? <laughs> this is supposed to be the everyone dies and that's what makes me cry issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What are what are these tears of happiness about? <laughs> I guess the, the the will one is not a tear of happiness. I I do wish if I had one if I had one uh, semi criticism or just straight up criticism, uh, I do wish they had done more to at least. And I know it's not necessarily a thing that happens immediately, uh, and they did sort of set it up with uh, Clara being less bigoted towards Petricor, but uh, but it's it's kind of it kind of hurts her arc because she has such a nice arc of like going from this sort of conservative bigoted sort of you know mother uh to someone who's literally teaching prisoners like uh the like spreading this uh idea of diversity and a in a new yeah. potential world and stuff and and accepting each other and it's like and that's such a satisfying arc and the idea of like and now she's going to go off on this sort of adventure of of bringing these people together to you know start the revolution but then to introduce that whole thing to it of of but also no trans people please in this in our revolution of acceptance and and love and uh and then you know all we get is that which you know is obviously sort of set up of uh all we get is Lexis pointing out that she's a hypocrite with the uh, with a quote yeah. from the book last issue, uh, and her her reaction of like, oh yeah, hmm, maybe I'm a dipshit on this in this regard, uh, and then but then you know leaving off with that is a little is a little disappointing. I wish we had I wish we had you know gotten a sort of like heart to heart scene with Petricor and Clara or something first. Uh, yeah, but you know otherwise barring that hey barring <laughs> that's okay the, that's that's his dad yeah I, I think that it's i think it's a really good send off for now <laughs> who knows should we should we do this last scene we're already starting to run long uh oh last thing last thing last thing last someone thing, last thing. took a fucking five minute interlude <laughs> to tell a childhood story about a <laughs> box <laughs> well you're the idiot that brought up the sandman casting news too so <laughs> uh, last thing though because this is we actually talked about this before but the uh the sort of manga influence uh the the portal effect behind marco when we see his reaction to the i know your father felt the same and everything and his crying feels like such a you know that thing where there's the uh lightning bolt type like yeah shatter like shock effect in in manga in the background like the revelation type of thing but just this sort of broken feeling i love that we get the edge of the tear portal uh that sort of torn shattered effect behind him uh that like might as well be his heart in this moment I... is is so cool and so effective I love the way he's framed here too. The way he's shot like slightly from below. It's a really good angle. It's cool. It's nice. Uh, and and also it's sort of like, you know, it's kind of matching her eyeline because she's looking up at him. Yeah, really puts you in that perspective. Hey, what happens on the what? Where, let's see the other side of this portal, Noah. We get a space shot of the rocket ship tree flying through the hive mine, and then we see inside 
Prince Robot in a Duke costume still is carefully stepping over the flesh of the dead tardigrade while Alana is repairing the ship with what looks like a fire flower extinguisher. Uh, uh, nope, a flower fire extinguisher <laughs> spraying green mist. Hazel appears in a swoosh of golden light. Alana looks at her and, and does the you thing that you mentioned. Huh. A moment later, we hear Petricor shouting, Wingnut bitch. Petricor arrives and punches Alana in the face. And Robot stacks it, steps in with his cannon saying, Your dimwit husband sent us the wrong Mooney. <laughs> <laughs> then Marco appears and explains the situation. Petricor is disgusted by it, but says, You're just lucky I'd never fell a female who's expecting. Uh, uh. And then she says, I can smell it from here. You're pregnant. All throughout the scene, Hazel is narrating about death. And then we end on death is fucking predictable. And then we turn to the final splash. But life has science experiments and free time and surprise naps and who knows what comes next. And it's a splash of Marco and Alana beside each other with Marco saying, oh, in shock, and Alana holding her stomach smiling. <laughs> My god, John, an... <laughs> An arc ended on some good, happy, cathartic stuff, and I'm oh sure nothing gosh. will go wrong ever again. Yeah, there you know the, the family. The family is united. You know, what? happily I know, ever after. I know this seems like a change of pace, but I'm gonna make a prediction now. The next arc, yep, even more upbeat, even more positive. Yeah, that's my yeah, prediction. I think so. I think it's gonna be just the. It's just gonna be a parade of fun. <laughs> it's the next arc, and so you know I, I'm not even gonna take the time to appreciate it now because I th I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say I'm gonna take this for granted right now because I'm gonna get to play more of it in the future. But this is fucking fantastic. It's really nice. Um, that I mean, generally this whole arc, uh, we talked about from the beginning, from like the Marco and Alana robbery. Which, by the way, you want to talk fucking. Projecting forward and fo foreshadowing. Uh -huh. First issue ends with Marco and Alana having sex for the first time in forever. Yeah. Last issue ends with uh, Alana being pregnant. Yep. Set up. And a fucking, I mean, even setting up the, uh, her smelling, uh, yeah. Marco. Yeah. Like, her magic nose. Toucan Sam. <laughs> Also, I like that Petricor is also on the left side of the scene here. Yeah. Which I'm just going to start keeping track of all this. I think it's a really, really good deception um, that they do throughout this issue with the Hazel narration where they're always talking about death and children dying and things like that. And then they end on this happy note of people being reunited and end of new life uh i want to go i want to point out the fact that we get we get two of the u's the the uh lowercase periodless u's and also we get the same thing when uh she's saying daddy it's the same way yeah so yeah the daddies we're really milking that one aren't we okay okay i like it you're just you're just you're just shitting all over this comic today. okay you know what? okay okay that is that is like my third criticism of this this issue but i'm gonna throw in one more here because i just realized how much i fucking hate in the second page of this scene uh <laughs> fritz robot's hand transforming <laughs> into the beam yeah it's, is it looks very flaccid <laughs> like a fucking nothing but foreskin and i really am not on board with this no shame to foreskin but uh to get it off your hand <laughs> i i love this flower fire extinguisher with yeah. the, where the like seed pod is like the the part and then, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the different. Go on. Oh, it's like, are you reading off I don't of, know. The, of the patent right now? I don't, I don't know the different parts of a fire extinguisher. The seed pod is like the canister. And then yes. there's like a stem going up. That's the hose. And then the flower is the nozzle. See? There you go. See? You I know. It. You've played the enough part Marta and then the Sunshine. part and the other part. <laughs> <laughs> no, this does. I, I like to imagine just with how much it's like sort of sticking to where she's 
uh, where you, you can see where she sprayed it. I like to imagine it's like that uh, that spray stuff that Iron Man uses in uh, Infinity War to like patch up a hole in the spaceship, yeah. where it's like the hardening thing. I got the sense that it's very like it. It felt to me like expanding foam or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh, yeah, that's rad. And this is all exciting. And fucking, we now have our man. What a good. I love the little like group pairings. Yeah. Uh, at the end of every uh every arc. So uh back on. Yeah. Do the, we want to the... review review where all of the main characters are right now? Yeah. Yeah. So so uh back on the uh back on the cliff planet we have Upshur and Doff with Goose Cliffania. No. 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 <laughs> No. <laughs> Fuck it is. I think I already called it Oceania once. Uh so back on Clefania we have uh <laughs> we have Upshur Doff, Goose, and Squire and Frendo, which is uh I, I love it. Not even and I would say that's you know, not even main characters. Which is some of the best stuff like when we got uh I loved the Gwendolyn brand uh Sophie stuff when those yeah. were arguably not at least original core characters. And then we have the Will and Sweet Boy going back to... And by the way, we didn't even mention that, the whole uh, go back to the, the chick who calls you out on your bullshit. Oh, yeah. I love the I love the idea that you know that she's talking about Gwendolyn despite him having <laughs> literally formerly having a cat that calls him out on his bullshit and that is its instinctual <laughs> ability but oh that's I, so I, true i didn't even get that i love i love just this concept of that's what he needs in his life and that's unconsciously like why he picked lion cat is because he yeah. needs someone that calls him out on his bullshit it's fantastic so we have the will and uh sweet boy going to i'm assuming track down gwendolyn and if sophie and lion cat are still with Gwendolyn. Yeah, we we haven't we haven't seen that crew in uh in a while. Eh? In, last in arc was the was the last. Well, where were they last? We saw them. Was that, that was it was, when the brand uh, got when chomped? he woke up? Uh, yeah, it was when they woke up the will after the brand got chomped. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and he yelled at them to get out, and that was the last time we saw them. Uh, and then we have on the rocket ship tree, we got uh four and. Finally, Hazel, Marco, and Alana, and fuck it, Petricor. Uh, I'm so pumped. Yep. Uh, good book, John. The good book. Do you have a favorite moment? Uh, the the daddy, daddy, daddy. Yeah, yeah. You, know you like me. it. You like. You like, you I like, like that daddy, daddy, daddy. <laughs> you like that daddy, daddy. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not gonna pursue this line of jokes right now. I think <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> yeah that's that's probably that's probably a good call <laughs> i th I think my favorite moment is the when the will breaks down the i miss you mm. i miss everybody yeah that's so raw yeah just such such like actual fucking introspection it's so good and and actually on that moment i think in my mind the soundtrack that plays when the will is walking away there for my song of the week is gonna be "Everybody Hurts" by REM. <laughs> you know, I was, I was, I almost uh, uh, suggested another song from that album. Oh, from uh, "Automatic for the People," but you know, I'll save that for another one. I'm gonna say because we have so many reunions and and some uh, some departures. Are you gonna say "Reunited" and it feels so good? God, no. I'm going to say, okay. because we also have some departures in here, I'm going to say We'll Meet Again by Vera Lynn. Oh. Famously at the end of Dr. Strangelove uh, is going to be it's gonna be my song. Also referenced in Pink Floyd's The Wall in the song called Vera. You know what? That suddenly makes sense, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we got that question theme. Oof. Oof. I've got, I've got, I've got a question. I've got a question this week, John. Yana. Yeah, <laughs> My question is: Did somebody say "bull"? <laughs> Literally, as you opened your mouth to say it, it occurred to me what was coming, and I was yeah, so happy about I could, it. I couldn't, and... I couldn't keep a straight face. <laughs> And that is legitimately our only. I am. I am literally crossing out 
my question on my notes. That is the question of the week. Uh, no, where can people find you? <laughs> I, I think we should have some questions of the week. Fuck no, fuck off. We have fucking 108 issues. One of the weeks can be, did somebody say bull? <laughs> okay, I guess so. Um, I don't know. You can find me uh, hiding in a box waiting are, for my cue. You're as deflated by this as everyone on the stage with me when that happened. <laughs> you just made the noise like my teacher looked when I looked back at her. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm also online and I'm uh, reading this book. Uh, and speaking of this book, a big thank you to Brian K. Vaughn, Fiona Staples, Photographics and Image Comics for making the best, gosh darn, dang tootin' comic book on uh, this side of the uh, fucking space. And Serpentine Galaxy. <laughs> I think we did that last time. That's why I stopped myself yeah. from saying it. Uh, and... Gar- this side of uh, Cliffania. <laughs> And Noah, I'm going to need you to deliver this final line here as if you were a first grader popping out of a box at a totally inappropriate time. <laughs> Action. Wait, should I should I say the bull thing or should I say the actual thing? No, hold on, hold on. Go with your heart here. Go with your heart on this one. Am I shitting? <laughs> and then, hold on. And then we have the silence. No. <laughs> and we're out. Bye. Bye. Oh. And it's it's mostly just dominated by this kind of profound landscape. It's a cover that you can hear and smell when you look at it. Yeah, it's weird because both of both it both hears it both hears it both sounds it smells like uh paper and ink too. I've noticed that. Go ahead and cut that one out, Haley.